Hey, 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 friends and listeners, welcome back to Truth, Lies, and Alibis, your true crime podcast that looks at things from the distinct perspective of two 911 dispatchers. Episode 16. Along the railroad tracks. Today, I tell Jess about the suspected serial killer, Charlie Ray Vines, a.k.a. the River Valley Killer. Jess, do you have an interesting fact for us this week? (gasps) How kind of you to ask. I do. (laughs) Did you know? That Russia is so big that it has 11 time zones within its country. I'm sorry, what? 11 time zones in Russia. That's confusing. (laughs) I think it's bad enough trying to figure out what time it is in another state. And there's like four time zones here. I agree. It's really annoying when you're going on vacation and like you're going to check into a hotel and you don't check the time. And you get there and you're like, yeah, I can check in. And they're like, no, no, you can't. You have to wait. That's annoying. I always get super paranoid when I have to fly. Yeah. And I'm always worried that if I have layovers or anything like that, that I'm like, oh, I, what, wait, what time does my, <laughs> my layover leave? Even though they like build that into your itinerary, like that's all taken into account of. I'm always like paranoid beforehand. Things that <laughs> give just <Jess> anxiety. <laughs> uh, yeah. I hate flying, period. Um, It's not my favorite thing to do. I feel like scared when we're taking off and landing and yeah. I don't mind flying so much. I So me and Kylie in November are doing a trip to Hawaii and that I'm nervous about because 90% of that flight is over water and that's a little scary. Yeah. But it'll be fine. Have you been to Hawaii? I've never been, which is why Uh, I wanted to go. That's cool. Yeah. You'll have to share pictures. It's technically a birthday trip, even though it's nearly almost to my next birthday. (laughs) It's a two-year Squishum's birthday present. That's cool. That's really cool. I can't wait to hear about it and see all the pictures. I'm excited. We said it last time. We should say it this time, too. We are recording this when we are currently sick. So that's why we sound stuffed up and froggy, because it's that time of year, and kids have germs, and I was around two of them for two hours, so I got sick. And I'm around lots of children all the time. That's my (laughs) life is sick children literally at home. Literally And at work. So it's cool. It's whatever. All right. Let's get down to the depressing story. So in last week's episode, we briefly talked about Charlie Ray Vines, the River Valley killer. His name came up in the Morgan Nick abduction investigation after his arrest in 2000 for attacking a 16-year-old girl. Do you remember his name? Yes, they thought that he was related because he lived nearby and possibly drove a red truck. Yeah. In the 1990s in Fort Smith, Arkansas, Charlie Ray Vines was divorced and lived with his two children. He was well known in his small community and often shared vegetables from his garden with his neighbors. They had no idea that he was a murderer, someone investigators believe is even a serial killer. Hmm. Fort Smith, Arkansas is the third largest city in Arkansas. Its population is about 89,000. It lies on the border of Oklahoma in an area called the River Valley. It is very much a small town where everyone knew everyone and no one locked their door kind of vibes, which we've already talked about is not smart. Lock your doors (laughs) and your windows. Yes, and everything. (laughs) And your cars. Get alarms, have cameras, um, spotlights. (laughs) All of the things. Motion sensors. Metal sheets that you can pull down over your windows. <laughs> Vines's first victim, or first known victim, was Lily Jones. She was an 89-year-old woman who lived by herself. She was legally blind, and on the night of April 10th, 1993, Charlie Ray Vines kicked her door open after he had knocked and asked to use her phone, and she had said no. He then savagely beat and raped her. At one point, she lost consciousness, and her attacker thought she was dead, so he left the house. He didn't take anything with him. There was nothing that indicated he was there for anything other than killing her and sexually assaulting her. Wow. Yeah. An 89-year-old woman who is blind. Near the home, they find a bush with cigarette butts indicating the attacker had stood and watched Lily before attacking her. I feel like that... Everybody check... Add this to your list of anxiety-inducing things and things to do. Um, In the daylight... When people can see you, 
when there's bright light out, go check around your bushes for cigarette butts. <laughs> if you don't smoke, um, just make sure there's none. I don't know. I'll be doing that every day for the rest of my life now. So <laughs> because this is the also, second story that we've had this. Yeah. And, and that's why I'm weird about windows. I love natural light. And the apartment I have now doesn't get enough of it. But I love natural light. So you see those houses with those like beautiful wall of windows, which I love. But I'm ultra freaked out at night with windows because the second people can see in and, and you can't, can't see, see out. out i have to close blinds yeah i do it to my mom's house all the time and it drives them crazy because they live somewhere where it's warmer so they can leave their like slider open and like with the breeze and everything like that the second the sun goes down i'm like closing everything up <laughs> you're like nope i'm like i can't tell if, if people are watching me or not and i don't like it yeah, and it always feels like they are. When we moved into our new house, there's we have that patio and there's that big window and then downstairs there's a big window and it like really freaked like I used to have these pretty curtains that I loved and they were kind of see-through and I thought I would be okay with them. No, I was not okay with them. It scared the crap out of me. I was like there's someone out there watching me. They can see in here. They can know what my house looks like and they're going to kill me and I'm going to end up on Dateline. And it's not going to be me talking to Keith Morrison. It's going to be somebody else. (laughs) I used to have nightmares about uh, like a crack in like a, you know how like your blinds will get stuck. And so there'll be a little bit of like a crack in between two blinds coming down. I used to have a nightmare that it was just an eye looking in from outside. Jessica, why would you (laughs) share this information with me? Because you tell me sad things all the time. I can freak you out every once in a while. You agreed to do this podcast. Yo, this is the fair play. I used to freak you out sometimes. (laughs) Okay, okay, I'll, I'll accept it. So, Lily was able to live on her own, but relied heavily on the help of neighbors to get groceries and to get to and from church and other social events. Miraculously, she survives the brutal beating. Lily is unable to identify her attacker since she is blind and DNA wasn't as advanced as it is today. There is no database at the time and you needed a DNA sample to compare against suspects. This made the investigation hard. She could tell investigators that she could feel the man's arms, face, and hair, and she thinks she knew him, but she couldn't identify him. Hmm. Criminal profilers believed at the time that the individual who attacked her possibly had a bad relationship with his mother or grandmother, that he had low self-esteem, and deliberately chose to attack a victim who could not protect herself because she couldn't say no. Yeah, that's pretty cowardly. Yeah. On June 23rd, just two months after the attack of Lily Jones, Juanita Wolford, who was 58, was discovered murdered in her bed. Her home was near the home of Lily Jones. She hadn't shown up to a scheduled church event, so the pastor sent someone to check on her. They found her door had been smashed in and that a strong odor was coming from the house. When they went to check on her, they found a blood-covered crime scene that was horrific. There was a trail of a large amount of blood from the living room to the bedroom. Above the bed was a bloody smear of handprints and a wet stain on the wall. There was also a bloody handprint and a shoe print on the wall above the couch, indicating the attack had started in the living room and that she had fought so hard he had to stabilize himself by putting a foot on the wall. The stains were determined to be urine, those stains on the walls. So after he sexually assaulted her and murdered her, he peed on her wall. What a fucking sicko. Yeah, there's lots of things wrong with this person. So many things. Juanita had been deceased for a few days and had been sexually assaulted post-mortem. Wow. Wow. How, where does that line up? How far in between Lily's attack and this one? Two months. Oh, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. This indicates that the killer is a necrophiliac and that he gets sexual pleasure from this because the victims aren't able to fight back. Again, he doesn't want his victims to fight back. He did not sexually assault Lily until he thought she was dead because she couldn't fight back. Fort Smith Police Department Captain Jay Ryder said it was a really horrific crime scene. There was blood in every place. In the living room, the attacker had kicked the door in. The door frame was shattered all over the room. Clearly, she had a violent confrontation. You could see defense marks all over her arms, stab wounds to the head and the torso. Jesus. Yeah. Like, good for her for fighting back that hard. Yeah, and it was like a big fuck you to him because he thought, oh, this Mm -hmm. frail old lady is going to be be so easy. And she was like, no, I'm not going down without a fight. Yeah. Juanita was described as a kind and loving person, and she was very loved by her friends and family. She loved to talk to everyone and get to know them, and her nephew said in the Oxygen special on this case that I watched that she would literally walk up to a stranger and she would just talk to them forever. That was the kind of person she was, and she just wanted to know about them and get to know them, and she was just really kind. So nobody could believe or understand why anyone would want to hurt her. 
She lived in a safe area at her parents' old home near the railroad tracks. So the railroad tracks go by Juanita's house and by Lily's house. And it's Mm. just like kind of around the corner. By the railroad tracks, the police find a blue baseball cap that possibly belongs to her attacker. They also find a bush with cigarettes around it, indicating the attacker had watched Juanita for some time before attacking. Don't like it. Check your bushes. Through her investigation, the police set up patrols at night, especially in the area of the train tracks, looking for anything suspicious. A tip is called in about a man named Anthony Barnes who was walking the train tracks at night months after the murder. They think the killer possibly walked the area because the train tracks went by both of the victims' homes. Anthony was known to be violent and was called Mad Anthony. He had battery and assault charges on his records, so they interviewed Anthony's cousin and uncle. They tell investigators he had just been released from prison in March of 1993, and that shortly after Juanita was murdered, he had relocated to another area of Arkansas. They also mm. gave evidence to the police a bloody knife and some bloody clothing that belonged to him, which that they I don't know had. how they had. Yeah. <laughs> They just had it in their possession. They were like, well, I'm just going to keep this for a rainy Actually, day. Actually, since you're here, this was weird. Do you want to take it? <laughs> when investigators talked to him, he says he had hit someone with glass and cut himself in the process, and that's how the blood got on his clothing. He denies being involved in the crimes, and he gives a DNA sample. They also take him. This part is so fucked up to me. They also take him to Miss Jones so she can feel him Ugh. because they can't do a lineup because she's yeah, legally that blind. Doesn't feel right. No, it. When I saw that on the the episode, I was like, oh, that makes me want to barf. One. Yeah. Two. How traumatizing for her. Yes. How strong of her to even yes. be willing to do that. What a trigger too. Like that could do some additional trauma to her. You know. Yeah. No, thank you. Hard pass. Also, when you do a photo lineup or you do a lineup or something like that, there's victim protection. Yeah. They don't know. They can't see who's there. So I doubt there was any of that for Lily. No, because he's literally standing right in front of her. Like, maybe he has handcuffs on, but like... Blindfold him or something? Like, that's not okay. No, nothing about it felt good to me. I literally, like, it made my stomach turn. I cringed. Yeah. She says... It doesn't feel like her attacker. And the DNA evidence is also not a match. So then they also receive a tip about a subject named Joe, a 19-year-old whose friends told investigators that he said he broke into Miss Woodford's home and killed her with a wooden stick. At the crime scene, there was a wooden stick that they thought she may have been stabbed with. Mm. He was brought in and interviewed and provided a semen sample. The sample did not match the semen evidence at the crime scene. The attacker was a secretor and he was not. And for those of you who don't know, secretor status refers to the presence or absence of water-soluble ABO blood group antigens in a person's bodily fluids. People who secrete these antigens in their bodily fluids are referred to as secretors, while those who do not are referred to as non-secretors. And this is what they kind of used back in the day before DNA evidence had progressed to where we are now. So much better. Thank God. What a weird thing to call it. Most of your friends about. No, oh. I don't necessarily care about that, but I was like, <laughs> they can call it whatever they want. <laughs> I was like, what does that even mean? And I've heard the term yeah. forever on all the shows, but I was like, I guess I'm going to Google it. But yeah, <laughs> he's like 19 years old and he's like, yeah, I broke yeah, into I this house lady. and killed her with a stick. Cool story, bro. Um, I got to make a phone call. Go get help, please. <laughs> Before you actually do something terrible like that. Yeah. Police eventually arrest Danny Bennett. He lived between the two women's houses along the train track route, and he had spoken to police in the investigation several times after he was witnessed behaving strangely. Every contact they had with him was in the early morning hours along the train track, so it was like two in the morning. The Hmm. sisters told investigators he had weird sexual quirks, that he had abused them when they were younger. Hmm. He had asked them to get rid of tennis shoes and a knife after Juanita's murder. He had also been known to be violent, and the cap near the crime scene was his. Did he live with his sisters? It wasn't really clear, but they came in and spoke to them about him, and they said he hated women, especially his mom, that he was abusive, all these things, and Mm -hmm. then they showed the cap to them and asked if they recognized it, the one they found near the train tracks, Uh and they were like, oh yeah, that's definitely his. And the the knife and the shoes, were they bloody? Or was he just like, hey, can you get rid of these things that I don't want anymore? He was just like, hey, can you get rid of this shit? Which is weird. That's so weird. If somebody came to me and was like, hey, can you get rid of this knife? (laughs) I'd be like, absolutely not. (laughs) Yeah, let me get a Ziploc baggie. (laughs) Yeah. Actually, uh, go ahead and place it in there. No, no, I don't want to touch it. Go ahead and put it in the bag. Yeah, put your fingerprints all over that shit while we're at it. Um, Let me get some gloves. Actually, do you, could you need to sneeze? Do you want to sneeze or spit in this bag? <laughs> do you have a tissue with you? Let me just wipe it all over Would your Would you like mouth. some water? 
They also spoke to his ex-wife and she said he had electrocuted her with light cables. Like he had hooked up these light cables to her breasts for like sexual pleasure and electrocuted her. And then he had also urinated on her at points in their relationship, and he had been super abusive. I am not one to kink shame, but that (laughs) shit has to be consensual. I'm not going to kink shame either, but none of that stuff sounds like fun to me. Well, no. (laughs) No, thank you. There are lots of things that sound fun to me. None of those things include that. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. (laughs) If it's not consensual, it's abuse. Well, and he was already abusing her, so. Yeah. Yeah. So even though he, we already know, he's not the killer, he's one sick puppy. Yeah, this guy's... Yeah. It gets weirder. He originally Needs denies help. killing Juanita, but eventually confesses to the crime after failing a polygraph test. He agrees to let the police search his house, and this is, again, I don't kink shame, but this is weird, and also, like, not sanitary. They find different <laughs> two-liter bottles throughout the house with urine in them. Like, no, lots of bottles see? of urine. He's just saving his pee. Nope, I'm not going to let that, I'm not going to ask. Nope. Well, let me tell you. I'm just kidding. I have no idea, and I didn't want to delve into it either. I don't actually care. (laughs) He's all, want to see my collection? Bottles of urine. Oh, I collect stamps. What do you collect? My pee. All I can think about is the Little Mermaid singing. (laughs) Look at this stuff. (laughs) Isn't it neat? neat? Wouldn't you think I'm a guy? A guy who has... So much pee. So much pee. Look at these bottles. (laughs) All I think about you is you're a guy with lots of problems. Can one bottle hold? (laughs) Oh my god. It gets better and better. Sorry. (laughs) Gotta find the humor in something. (laughs) However, after his arrest, another victim is attacked. In August of 1995... 74-year-old Ruth Henderson was brutally assaulted and killed, and the crime scene looked very similar to Juanita Wooford crime scene. Ryder said, this is a quote, you could almost take the crime scene photos and overlap them and see similarities. Huh. So, they go there, the front door's crashed in, there are puddles of blood throughout the house, she was stabbed to death like the other victims, there is urine at the crime scene, Danny Bennett was released from prison and the charges are dropped at the time, because... The, a judge determines with all the evidence it's not sufficient enough to keep him and then an evidence of another crime and even the investigators were like oh fuck we arrested the wrong guy and it's too similar to be like copycat or something like that also i know we've talked about urine too much but like it's not sanitary and then somebody could take your urine and frame you what if this killer had been like i'm gonna <gasps> take this bottle of urine and pour it everywhere this guy's got bottles of it he won't <laughs> notice if one's missing <laughs> The DNA evidence at Juanita's murder was inconclusive, and Ruth's murder obviously wasn't committed by Danny. The taped interview of the confession of Danny Bennett is reviewed, and it also shows that he had been supplied information on the crime scenes before he gave his confession. So they had been like, oh, he gave all this information that only the killer would know in his confession, but they had taped previous interviews, and investigators had leaked that information to him. Way to go. Yeah. For five years, investigators searched for the murder, and then in March of 2009, a 911 call comes in. I'm going to send you two clips of the 911 call. In March of 2009, the parents of a 16-year-old girl come home to find Charlie Ray Vines, their family friend, raping and stabbing their 16-year-old daughter. Oh, my God. And that's the first 911 call I sent you. So in the 911 call, she says... It's the victim that calls. Yes. She said, he cut my throat, he raped me. bleeding to death. And then the second voice you hear, the mom picks up the phone and says, please hurry, he raped my daughter. Okay, he cut her throat. Yeah. Her stepfather, who was disabled, beat Charlie Ray Vines pretty profusely before the police took him into custody, which I was like, you go. I was watching this documentary about it, me and Nova, and she was like, I like this stepdad. And I was like, me too. So he puts him in a chokehold. He tries to shoot him twice, but the gun misfires the first time and then he misses. So he proceeds to beat the man with the handle of the gun and cracks his skull, which I was like, yeah, yeah, good for you, dad. You know what I mean? And 
The victim had been choked. She had been stabbed in the head. Her lung was deflated and there was blood throughout the house. God, that's so violent. Again, like we've kind of talked about it in the past that like it's one level of violence to shoot somebody. It's another level to do something that requires your hands on them. Like the guy that bashed people with the axe handle and the rock. Yep. And then this guy to like stab somebody repeatedly. Like that's a that's a whole nother level. And somebody you no. Apparently, Charlie had thought that her mom would be there alone, and when he found the 16-year-old girl home alone, he decided to rape her instead. Oh, so this is, sorry, this is the one teenage victim that you mentioned from your previous. So mm-hmm. she wasn't even the attendant, it was the mom. Nope. Which is why it also leads me to believe he probably wasn't involved in Morgan's case, because he literally goes over there looking for the mom when she lets him into the house because she's like, oh, he's our friend. He sits down and starts watching TV with her for some time before he then walks to the kitchen, calmly gets a knife and begins stabbing her. She runs to the bathroom. He follows her, stabs her in the head and then begins raping her. And that's when her parents come home and the dad takes over and beats the shit out of him, which good for him. Yeah. Thank God they came home when they did. Yeah. When EMTs arrive, they say the suspect needs to be transported or he wouldn't make it, which I'm like, okay, she her lung is deflated and she's probably bleeding out. The stepdad said in the oxygen special that he said, and this is a quote, my daughter leaves first or no one leaves the mountain. Hell yeah. And I was Get like. Right on to this guy, right? This like, guy deserves an award. Like father of yeah. the fucking year. Yeah, absolutely. Charlie Ray Vines was arrested and agreed to a plea deal. He had to give full confession, like full confession and give details of his crimes. He sits down with investigators and gives very detailed confessions. He claimed, though, that he didn't remember having sex with the victims post-mortem. His plea agreement included giving full and honest details. So they're like, hmm, because through all of this, like, all the crimes kind of match each other. And even though she's younger, it still matches the crime scenes. So they are like, "Mm, this is probably related, and they're able to link it eventually through DNA evidence that they all are related, and he committed these crimes. And they're like, well, you're going to get the death penalty unless you plead guilty and you tell us everything. And so he's like, oh, I I remember this. I remember beating them. I remember breaking into their homes. Like, he gives details about that. But then he's like, oh, I don't remember having sex with them after they were dead. I was drinking and I was high. So they're like, yeah, we don't believe you. Sorry, yeah. dude. And if you don't tell us everything, we're revoking your plea deal. Yeah. We that's can go to part trial. Of the deal. Yeah. Miraculously, his memory comes back after that happens. Wow. I'm shocked. <laughs> and he admits that he did have sex with his victims. He admits that he had sex with them post-mortem. Investigators believe that he not only premeditated their attacks, but also the rapes after the murders. That mm-hmm. was his plan because he, he thought his first victim was deceased. His second victim was definitely deceased. And I think his third victim, he just like probably knew his time was limited, maybe. Yeah. Because he gave information about the previous attacks, he would not face the death penalty. Again, I say DNA evidence has come a long way in the seven years since the first attack. So they were able to link his DNA to all of the attacks. He tells investigators that he had raped and murdered several elderly women and that he often fanat- fantasized about necrophilia. His parents had owned a mortuary when he was growing up, and his father had been a deputy coroner at one point. He would also work as a security guard for a mortuary in his adult life. Let's continue, because I don't think any of us need to stray with thoughts about that. Girl, can we go back to the pee? (laughs) His family was well-known and well-liked in the community. So when investigators, and some of the investigators knew them, right, because... They own a mortuary. Yeah. Yeah. And they were like, well, this sucks because they're a good family. But anyway, Lily knew him because this is where it gets fucked up. So he, they ask him, like, how do you know? I mean, it's already fucked up. All of it's fucked up. The pee, the dead bodies, the stabbing, the rape, all of it is disgusting. It just gets worse. (laughs) Lily knew him because she went to his parents' church and he had known her his whole life. Yeah. So that explains why she said she knew him. A friend of his lived next door to Juanita, and he had seen her a couple of times before the attack. Side note, this friend of his was a neighbor of Juanita who would, like, go out on his motorcycle and make loud noises, and she complained about him. So he had even been interviewed in the process of the investigation and determined not to be involved. But his friend friend. had seen her because he had been at his house. 
Mm. And then, obviously, he knew this 16-year-old victim because he was a family friend of the dad's. And the dad even said, like, he was a good friend. Like, he would come over and do this and that with us. And, like, we trusted him completely. He seemed like a good person. They're always good at faking it. 100%. Fake it being normal. Until they can't anymore. Some immediate friends of his told investigators that when he drank, he would get aggressive. He was known to do violent stuff, and one friend even said in the documentary that he had shot at one of his kids with a shotgun when he was mad at them. At his own kids or at the friend's kids? At his own kids. Like, <laughs> He was only arrested for two murders, but investigators believe that he was involved in multiple homicides, including the murder of Missy Witt and possibly the disappearance of Morgan Nick. How fucked up is this, though? He doesn't get arrested for Lily's assault because the statute of limitations had run out. I f- that oh, wait I'm not gonna jump on that soapbox because we I already did have. already yeah yeah and it'll be the same conversation if you listen to the previous one you know where I stand on that if you didn't go back and listen to it because I don't want to get riled up <laughs> <laughs> okay so Melissa Witt aka Missy Witt was a hard-working 19 year old college student she was super busy being an honor student at her college and working at a local dental clinic as a dental assistant her friends describe her as friendly kind and hard-working On December 1st, 1994, when she was getting ready to go to school, her and her mother got into a fight over money, and her mother left for work, left a note, didn't say goodbye or anything, telling her to meet her later at a local bowling alley if she wanted to come by to eat. Between 6.30 and 7 p.m., she went to the bowling alley, parked her car, but she never made it inside. Investigators Mm. believe she was abducted in the parking lot. There was blood and Missy's keys found in the parking lot around the vehicle. Mm. For six weeks, they searched for her. On January 13th, 1995, two hunters in the Ozark National Forest discovered Missy's body. This was 45 miles from her Fort Smith home. She was nude and placed near a headstone-shaped rock. Her clothing and personal items were never found, and Charlie was thought to possibly have been involved in her murder. However, this abduction did not match his typical MO. His victims were elderly women who he attacked at home and brutally beat before having sex with them. And he didn't transport them anywhere. No. And a criminal profiler did not believe that Charlie Ray Lyons had been involved in her murder simply for that reason, which is, I point this out because it also leads me to believe he probably wasn't, again, involved in Morgan's murder. Another subject, Larry Swearinger, was also a person of interest in her case, and he's convicted of the murder of Melissa Trotter, who was also 19 and found in the Arkansas forest. And it seems like if you're comparing the two, he probably is more likely to have done it than Charlie Ray Vines. But no one's ever been convicted of her murder, so her case is also Mm. still open. Charlie Ray Vines was incarcerated from 2001 to 2019, serving his life sentence, but died in Arkansas Maximum Security Prison southeast of Pie Bluff, and he died of cancer. Which, if you'll remember in the last episode we talked about, they were going to go interview him, but he was, like, in a coma-like state, dying, Mm -hmm. and I'm like, it's kind of sucky because he only had to serve so many years, and then he died. Yeah. You won't ever catch me in Arkansas. (laughs) I'm just kidding. I'm not holding it against the state of Arkansas, but I feel that way currently. (laughs) You'll probably forget about it. It's fine. You know what I won't forget about? An eyeball Mm. looking through the blinds. You're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's just, he's just a horrible person. There's a lot of horrible people that you talked about (laughs) in this episode. (laughs) So many. There's a lot of horrible people in Arkansas, apparently. But um, there's a lot probably a lot more in florida if you listen and you're in arkansas there's horrible people everywhere but we're just (laughs) pointing you out now because the case happened there sorry (laughs) (laughs) um but that poor 16 year old like yeah like yeah she survived but she has to live her whole life with probably physical impairments mental emotional emotional, just for the rest of her life yeah it's just heartbreaking yeah. And also, the more I do research and the more I learn about cases I hadn't previously known about, which is surprising because I watch everything and anything I can about true crime, the more I realize, like, how many cases are unsolved. Yeah. And it's just kind of sad. Especially when they happen before DNA became so advanced. Mm-hmm. Because if that stuff wasn't saved or if that was just never on file, like, there's nothing to track down. Th- that's the thing, right? Like, you could dump a body in the woods and as long as nobody saw you, then how are they going to know you're involved, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Please don't Which do is... that. But you could. <laughs> I'm not saying me. No, I'm talking to our listeners. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't do that. Well, our first rule is don't murder. So yeah. 
that that's falls true it that. falls put it under there but i said used to y- you can't do that now Mm-mm. you're gonna leave something behind in which dna dna is everywhere thank god for dna yeah i always i told you this before but i always joke around that no i can never commit murder because my hair falls out like crazy so like i would just leave strands of my hair everywhere yep. like confetti <laughs> yeah dna confetti ew <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. Additional information for each case can be found on our website, truthliesandalibis.buzzsprout.com. New episodes will be uploaded every Monday. Find us on Facebook and Instagram at truthliesandalibis.